in this video, I'm going to explore the origins of music and uh, take you through a brief trick in history about its evolution in the ancient world and how it came down to us. Where did music come from? This question is unanswerable. Wherever there was a human society, there was music. Music is as old as humanity itself. We have been talking about our brains and music, how it's an inseparable duo. Uh, music is thought to have arisen from actually an imitation of nature or a learning mechanism about what nature entails. And throughout time, as the humans settled for agriculture, there has been musical traditions in pretty much all the ancient early civilizations that we know about. Some of these civilizations assigned ritualistic, religious or social roles to music. Some thought that it should have magical properties or properties that are connected with, for instance, healing or astrology. And there is just no human society that was indifferent to music and had no music in their daily life or practices. However, these sounds didn't come down to us. All we have is speculation. We are uncovering great temples, for instance, the one in Göbekli Tepe, which is 11,000 years old, but we have no idea what kind of ritual was performed there. What we can guess is definitely it's a ritual that involved heightened speech and music. From similar structures like the Stonehenge, we can speculate that uh, the stele, these stones, were actually erected to uh, confine sound and reflect it somehow from specific angles. Here's an ancient Roman saying, verba volant scrita manant. Uh, although in an ancient society music could have played an integral part, we have absolutely no idea because nobody thought about writing it down or there was any means to capture music as it is some entity that contains both sounds and rhythms and timbre and uh, all kinds of attributes about performance. There was no comprehensive script to capture it all down. About the prehistory of music, all we can speak about is that we have evidence in form of iconography, these cave paintings that depict music or musical practices, uh, people playing instruments, uh, people banging on stones with stones or uh, rudimentary drums and very few artifacts. Uh, since artifacts were fashioned from perishable materials, only very few fragments remained and the bone flute that you see on my screen is one of these. This flute was unearthed somewhere in Slovenia and it's carbon dated to 43,000 years ago. Actually, at some time, paleoanthropologists thought that uh, music gave Homo sapiens an edge over extinct species of humanoids like uh, the Neanderthals or the Denisovans, since Homo sapiens could pass down knowledge through music and organize societies with the help of music. It was thought to have overcame uh, these other species of humans. Now we know that it was just an assimilation and DNA from both Denisovans and Neanderthals are in our genes. We know for sure that from Neanderthal settlements in Gibraltar, Spain, that they also had musical practices. And we know for sure that this is a musical artifact because the holes are drilled intentionally using flintstone. They are drilled at exact locations. It can be well played, uh, providing many pitches by manipulating by the mouth and um, nasal cavities, the overtone series. When we talk about the ancient world, there's no way avoiding the ancient Egyptians. They have erected greatest monuments of humanity for millennia, basically. The highest building, the Pyramid of Giza, stood unchallenged for about 4,000 years after it was built. It was only surpassed in 1889 by the Eiffel Tower. Uh, therefore, it's unthinkable that uh, such monument builders were indifferent to music, which itself was also something monumental that is built upon ratios, just like buildings. So it was quite an important part, we know, of 
Egyptian religion and ritualistic practices, but we just can decipher so much from script, which is also a symbol script, as you know, the hieroglyphs are not like uh, the alphabet. Uh, so we can only guess at this heset, which means song, music, musician, sometimes even dancer. Music and dance were actually inseparable, as we understand, from Egyptian uh, iconography. So um, we have actually very faint ideas about how Egyptian music could have sounded like. We can't even give you some sort of approximation and all the Egyptian music you find on YouTube are just modern um, hallucinations, I should speak. We have no way as musicologists to certainly say that this piece came down to us from the time of ancient Egypt. There are some working songs that are still being sung in the Nile Valley, but we can never be sure if the tradition is an unbroken tradition or not. What is also curious is that what we understand as music therapy, the especially mental healing powers of music, um, actually were thought upon by ancient Egyptians. They were the first people to think if uh, you could acquire a better functioning mind through music. And the center was built, a temple was built in the reign of Hatshepsut that priests and priestesses healed patients using harps and sestra. These are these rattle-like instruments that you see in the bottom picture. So which is the oldest piece of music that could come down to us? Actually, it's not from ancient Egypt, but it's from ancient Mesopotamia. On the screen, you see a clay tablet. It's a cuneiform inscribed tablet that was found in the remains of the royal palace in Ugarit. They were actually a declining civilization, the Hurrians, and wanted to preserve their culture. They wanted to preserve their religious practices. And this is actually a hymn sung to one of their goddesses. So only the most valuable, the most worthy pieces were uh, adapted to be written onto the cuneiform tablets. We can actually partially read these. We know that they are music because of the inscriptions. We know that this collection even gives us some information about tuning of the instruments that are required to perform these pieces. Actually, uh, you see one Assyrian harp on the screen. And uh, the names of the people, at least some people who compose these pieces, the one that we have complete, the one that you're going to hear in the YouTube video is actually anonymous. Its composer is not recorded. And this is also an approximation. We are not sure if it should sound this way or not. We can't be sure because uh, we are just guessing at it using the Greek music theory. We are just thinking this should have sounded like this because of the ratios and tuning system, which I'm going to detail in a minute. It was actually the ancient Greeks whose culture provided the basis of Western thought and Western civilization, and music was one of the most important aspects of their life. Day-to-day -day life also was actually quite musical. Uh, on the right-hand picture, you see an amphitheater. This is somewhere in Turkey. 
and well, it's quite well preserved. The word orchestra actually comes from this very part uh, right under the proscenium, under the stage. Uh, but we have no idea what kind of orchestras the Greeks had. Actually, they had choirs for the most part, we understand from writings, or could certainly bring an ancient Greek piece back to life. These are fragments. These are fragments of uh, papyruses that are found in, for instance, Ptolemy in Alexandria or uh, in Anatolia. But we cannot really read the notation the way we can read modern notation uh, from ancient Greece. The person who patiently wrote down everything first is none other than Pythagoras. We know him as a mathematician for the most part, but he was a great musician. Uh, according to legend, actually, uh, the ratios governing music uh, that form the basis of all musical systems, the guiding principles of tuning that belong to all civilizations of humans around the world are based on nature, on natural law of overtone series. So whenever you think of a string which is tensioned on a given surface and just vibrate it the way Pythagoras does in this picture, you're going to get a fundamental frequency. The string will vibrate throughout its length. It will also form a cloud of overtones. It's going to vibrate half its length, one third of its length, one fourth of its length, so on and so forth. And we're going to get ever more fainter, like the spectrum of a rainbow, uh, these overtones that provide, besides that fundamental frequency, uh, different octaves of that uh, fundamental frequency. The word octave comes from octa, and uh, Pythagoras was the first person to think of it, discover it. These natural ratios actually are also dictating that there are some integer value multipliers that form on this very string too. The interval fifth, uh, the octave is an interval of eight, and that's the first distinct, very loudly audible, different pitch that is formed on this fundamental. Apparently Pythagoras discovered this while he was just strolling around in his island Samos and he was just visiting some blacksmiths uh, and uh, when he heard that the apprentice blacksmiths were hammering at the iron with smaller hammers and the uh, master blacksmiths had these big hammers that create a lower sound and he heard that the smaller the hammer gets the higher the sound of the beating becomes and then he starts to experiment he has bells ordered he has different metal bars ordered and he compares he builds himself an acoustic lab if you will and then carefully notates all of his findings and calculates a tuning system which actually pretty much still functions today. It's got a major flaw, the Pythagorean comma, but that hasn't prevented Western music to develop around it. I am going to talk about the Pythagorean comma and its consequences in the next of these lectures. Actually, the Middle Eastern or Asian tuning systems are all related to the uh, Pythagorean tuning system that was coming down to us from the ancient Greeks. Here you see a representation of, an imagined representation of the school of Athens. For a very long while, the Hellenistic period, Athens was thought to be a pinnacle of Western civilization, the time when Plato and Aristotle were actually teaching there. They had many pupils. So, of course, this is a fanciful painting by the Renaissance Italian painter Raphael. And the central figures you see discussing are Plato and his uh, disciple, his student Aristotle. They had very staunch beliefs about music. They really did investigation and wrote about philosophically and politically about music. Plato firmly believed, for example, that there is a doctrine uh, about music and ethos, human behavior, human morals are affected by it. So music of a certain type is essential to really develop this strong person, strong specimen of the society who is presentable in every way. And that specimen is trained also in musical arts to keep his mind in balance, in check. So uh, for instance, if you would like to have warlike specimens trained, 
such as the warriors of Sparta, then you would need to play a certain type of music. You need to train them with a certain type of music. Aristo expanded his ideas and this was carried down to us and has always been a musical rule, a rule of thumb throughout the Middle Ages, throughout the Renaissance, even throughout the Enlightenment age. My last bit of ancient Greek musical evidence is a tombstone. This is the epitaph of Seiklos from AD 200, found in Anatolia close to Aydın. It's a tombstone commissioned by a loving spouse, probably from a husband to a wife. And uh, apparently the wife died young and she really loved this song. This actually is a drinking song whose words and interpretation uh, you can find in the video below. And it talks about actually time flowing so fast and life being so precious. So it's more or less like the famous Turkish drinking song, Ağlama Deymez Hayat Bu Göz Yaşlarına. So we know that this is certain musical notation and we can read it using, of course, Pythagorean music theory, which was also later on expanded by other uh, philosophers, other mathematicians. Um, an example would be Aristoxenus. As Greeks were very fond of music and the idea of, for example, a musical contest to be held to find out who is the best singer or who is the best composer is a Greek idea. Since they loved having music in every aspect of life, uh, it's no surprise that a loving spouse just devoted her favorite song to be sung in the gravestone of his wife forever. So the musical notation besides the script, besides the letters, was put down into the stone. That's how it's complete and that's how we understand. Here, these symbols are actually the musical notes and this is the Greek script. Thank you for watching this presentation. Uh, there will be other similar, smaller videos that are assigned weekly. So think of your weekly assignments as these collections of videos.